All right, let's get started. So, uh, very happy to have uh, Danya Sridhar here today. She is a fifth year computer science uh, uh, PhD student at uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, she is a student of Lisa Couture's. Um, she's interested in statistical relational learning, causal inference and discovery, computational social science, and biology. Great, uh, thanks for the, the introduction. Um, so I'm Danya. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my, my research today on uh, structured probabilistic models for computational social science. Um, so with the amount of social media data and uh, web logs and logs from applications, um, there's this great opportunity for computational methods to make inferences that can really help answer some social science questions. For example, um, on the web, you might have uh, logs of users from applications. You might also have sort of longitudinal data of um, user behavior. And this can help us answer questions like uh, characterizing people's moods or understanding their various behavioral factors. And you might have dialogue and interaction data from social media um, with people talking and interacting. And that can help us understand people's attitudes towards one another and understand how new links might form in social media. But these kinds of inferences are very different than standard machine learning tasks in that uh, these inferences are often interrelated across users and across uh, timestamps because there's a structure to these kinds of domains. And then um, importantly, you get sort of uh, many signals for any given user or um, uh, you get different amounts of information for different users, and you have heterogeneous data that you want to combine in a principled way. And then also, we often need to go beyond prediction in these kinds of domains and actually make sort of um, new, discover new domain knowledge and make causal inferences to be able to, you know, help experts understand the domain better. So, my technical contributions in this space has been to develop probabilistic models that can address these kinds of challenges. Um, these methods can exploit the structure in these domains, few signals of different reliabilities, um, support causal inference from observational data, and discover new patterns. And um, so as a, as a roadmap for this talk, first I'm going to dive into a very simple sort of motivating example um, that can illustrate the needs for all these uh, sophisticated techniques. And then after that, I'm going to dive into each of my contributions in more detail and show how they apply. So first, a problem that you know we can all relate to, um, recent issues come up in news all the time. And um, an important problem is to understand attitudes and how users feel about these topics. So we want to understand stance. And um, a recent issue has been net neutrality with key actors like Ajit Pai and Eric Schneiderman. And one data set for this might be social media. So on these social media sites, you'll have these top actors themselves write posts. So Ajit and Eric will, will talk about their viewpoints. And then regular users will retweet or reply and um, support or disagree with these top users. So you have a supporter of Ajit Pai's who's saying, you know, go Ajit or go Mr. Pai. Um, and then you have people replying to one another as well. So these, you know, um, there's a debate going on on one of Eric Schneiderman's tweets. So the standard approach for then modeling text documents of this will vary anywhere along the spectrum between unsu unsupervised techniques all the way to fully supervised techniques. So methods like topic modeling will try to partition these, these words into sort of support and against topics and understand how documents and tweets will you know, fit into these two partitions. Um, you can use sort of pre-trained um, sentiment uh, analysis types of dictionaries like word to vec might give you something, you know, information about the semantics of these words. And then there's manually annotated dictionaries as well that tell you how um, words score against a whole bunch of different kinds of categories like LIWC. Or you can get manually um, obtained annotations and then train a fully supervised model to understand stances. And these methods can go pretty far. So 
we might understand that Ajit Pai and his supporters, you know, have a you know strong probability to be against or sorry for net neutrality, whereas you know Eric Schneiderman's against, and we might with less confidence but still correctly side um, the two people who were debating on Eric Schneiderman's post as being, you know, one of them is you know, for net neutrality and one of them is against. But if we take a closer look, it turns out that one of the people who seemingly was supporting Ajit Pai was writing a very sarcastic tweet. So, you know, it's very clear when, when we read the tweet that he's, you know, saying thank you for having the bravery uh, to stand against giant corporations. So this is very sarcastic and this is not something that text alone is going to be able to um, side correctly. So how can we improve upon mistakes and errors like this? So one thing is to take a step back and, and realize that there's a lot of dependencies in this network. So we can see that um, this sarcastic user at some point had liked and or retweeted one of Eric Schneiderman's posts and so we can use that supports relationship between the two of them to enforce that consistency across predictions to say that people who share um, people who support one another should uh, share the same stance. The other thing is we might have a lot of different data sources as well to help us in this stance classification problem. So Eric and um, Ajit might have written uh, articles themselves, op-eds for major news sources, or they could have ha had articles written about them. And these are kind of um, high signal uh, information sources that we'd like to use in our problem. And for regular users, we might have mentions and retweets and hashtags. Um, so we want to combine these sources of varying reliability in a um, principled way. Then finally, there, there are long range sort of um, dependencies in structures like this that won't be obvious to um, us as humans. And so simple, you know, um, people that share the same, uh, people that retweet one another share the same stance might be something that's obvious to us. But we'd like to discover new patterns and um, we might end up discovering a much longer range pattern that says, you know, users who retweet those followed by top users actually share the same stance. So you might find this multi-hop sort of complex path that might not be obvious to us as humans. So um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about how I've developed methods that can um, address these uh, various needs of computational social science and it kind of looks like some of my color is off on these slides. Um, so for each of these contributions, I'm gonna focus in on a specific uh, problem, a case study, but um, we'll kind of see that there's, you know, these, these approaches um, can more broadly and generally be applied to a lot of computational social science problems and they work in tandem. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, online debate and discussion. Um, and there we will kind of see patterns um, for, and templates for exploiting structure. And then to look at how methods can fuse signals, um, I'm going to look at detecting indicators of uh, alcoholism relapse from social media. And then lastly, I'll talk about um, supporting causal inference and um, discovery from observational data and we'll look at a use case in mood modeling for this. So like I said, I'll be focusing on individual problems but um, these, these uh, approaches are more broadly applicable to across a whole variety of computational social science problems and we'll see that throughout the talk. Um, before I dive into my work, I'm going to give a little bit of background on um, tools that I'll be building my work on. So one way to represent relationships between users or between entities, as well as um, talk about constraints across predictions is with logic. So from our motivating example, we might encode um, a constraint that says that people that retweet one another should share the same 
side or the, the same stance on an issue. And um, you know, logic is a powerful language for this, but um, you might get conflicting observations or conflicting evidence, and this happens often with data, and this is a big problem with logic. So on one hand, we see that we get a you know, correct instantiation of this rule where um, Eric Schneiderman does same, share the same side as someone that retweets him, but Ajit Pai may have retweeted Eric as well, and now we get an incorrect um, conflicting piece of evidence. So one of the main problems with logic is that it leads to these infeasible states where there's no assignment, um, and this is a combinatorial optimization problem which doesn't scale. So my work uses probabilistic soft logic, um, and I'm going to just give a quick overview, and you can, um, for more details, you can look at other work. Um, and here we first relax these variables to be between 0 and 1 rather than take on um, yes or no sort of values. And when we do this, we also have to relax our understanding of whether a rule is satisfied or not. So we apply um, one particular relaxation in this, this, this language. And like regular logic, we have this property that if the rule is satisfied, there's no penalty that we incur for making a particular assignment. But given some assignments, if the rule isn't satisfied, then we get a penalty that looks like this. It's, um, it turns out to be a linear function of the variables, and we get this from a specific relaxation of logic called the Lukashevitz t-norm. Um, but I won't go into detail here. So putting it all together, given rules and a set of inferences that we want to make, so in this case, the stances for all the users, and given some observations, um, the goal of inference in probabilistic soft logic is to come up with a set of assignments that minimize all the, penal the soft penalties to these rules. And the form of that inference um, turns out to be a convex optimization problem, and so you can um, do inference exactly, and it's fast. Um, so this is the tool that I'll be building off in my work today, and so I'll go into the, the first part of the talk on um, templates for exploiting structure in, in social science problems. So we already talked about the need to understand stances on issues. So um, on social media, people often debate and have discourse about various topics that come up. And in order to understand ideologies and biases, a key first step is to understand how people feel about topics. So online debate forums are on, um, many of them are on social, uh, on the internet, and they're uh, an important data set to be able to study this problem. So if we zoom into a specific you know, thread, you might get this sort of structure where there's a topic, and one user will initiate a discussion, and other users will reply. So we have um, two people who reply to the, um, person who, who's initiated this thread, and they're both um, against this, the initial user. And then the initial user might write back at the end of it all. And so the text actually gives us two signals. One, it tells us about how people feel about the topic, but it also tells us how people feel about one another. So it gives us some indication of agreement or disagreement, um, and the, basically the polarity of the interactions that people have. So in the stance classification problem, we want to understand or infer um, a stance for every single net, uh, user in our network. And in this particular um, instance, we're going to treat it as a supervised classification problem where the labels are either self-reported by users on these forums or uh, we get them from annotation. Before we get into modeling, there are two important questions we have to answer. So the first one is about um, the right level of granularity at which to kind of aggregate this data. So in one hand, we can say um, we want to look at users. So we'll call that you know, the user or author level. And what we'll do is for people who author posts, we'll aggregate or concatenate all their text 
and we'll um, get feature vectors that way. And then if we don't have labels at the level of the, the user already, the way we would get it by is by looking at the, uh, the majority label of their posts. The other way of aggregating information might be by saying that posts are the units that we care about, um, identifying stands for. And there, uh, we'll treat each post individually when we want to get features and when we want to get labels, if we don't have it for the posts already, then we'll just apply the author label to the post. So these are, go for it. So how much of a problem is it that you're classifying things into plus minus, sides width, doesn't side width, but in the real world, everybody's view is nuanced. Yes. And a lot of the disagreements you see in online forums is where somebody says X, and they say, oh, you're conservative, and you say, no, actually, I'm a liberal, but I draw the line exactly. at this. And this seems like this approach couldn't handle that. Um, right. Because there's a ground truth plus or minus that you're looking to find. Right. So there is a lot of work on doing unsupervised um, or semi-supervised or weekly supervised kind of stance to classification as well. Um, so this idea of applying structure or exploiting structure in the problem can definitely generally be applied to unsupervised techniques as well. So in this case, I'm focusing on, yes, someone has cited themselves as pro or anti. Um, and this does actually come up quite a bit in that in a lot of these uh, online debate forums, people do cite themselves by in a binary sort of way. So um, the supervised methods still apply, but this, this idea that I'll show of exploiting structure will still apply in the unsupervised settings. Okay, so um, this is this first question of aggregating information. And the second question, um, I think, kind of starts to get to your point of what are more nuanced ways we can handle this text. And so, um, and I should have mentioned that in the, the sort of previous question, a lot of prior work has treated um, posts as the unit of interest and they've done post stance detection. Um, Whereas we've asked this question of, you know, what's the appropriate level of modeling in, in, this, in the problem? So um, a lot of previous work has made this, this assumption here as well that um, replies should be an indication of disagreement in um, citing stance. So of course, that's probably true in a lot of online debate forums, but Exactly like you said, people will say things like, I disagree with this aspect of your argument, but I do agree with this. And so that, you know, this sort of um, more simple or naive way of treating disagreement um, would not be able to capture that. So we asked this question of, is it more appropriate to actually model the polarity of the replies jointly together with the stance? So I'm going to build up the models for this. So the first kinds of um, intuitions that you can model is say that um, I'm going to build a, a local classifier of text using logistic regression and um, I'm going to use the class probabilities to say uh, to predict my global stance variable. So I can say that my, my text classifier gives me my final label. Now building on this we can add the um, Go ahead. Um, a couple of slides ago, you were laying out these two ways of yeah. thinking about the problem, like the, at the user level or the post level. Did you pick one of those? or? We're going to evaluate all, all these different modeling choices. In both, in both ways. That's right. Basically. Yeah. But this looks like user level. Yeah, that's a great, yeah. So the figures are going to look like they're at the user level, but you can substitute users with posts as well, and these rules will still hold. OK. Um, so the, the naive you know, collective classification assumption I was talking about where you look at a reply and you assume that it's a disagreement. And the way that you'd model this is to say that if users disagree, then they should have opposite stances. But the more sophisticated thing to do would be to come up with a text classifier that identifies disagreement as well. And then you can include then more sophisticated rules that propagate these two different inferences. So you can say that if people agree, they should have the same stance. 
or that if two people have different stances, they should disagree. And you can come up with all combinations of these rules, and we, we did. So I'm just um, going to show a subset of the rules that we used, but um, this is, it's all in this spirit and this flavor. So we evaluate all combinations of these modeling choices that I talked about on two different online debate data sets. So four forums and create debate, and we got four topics from each, and um, they have about 300 users um, in each topic that author about four to 19 posts. And so to recap, the, the author level was where we would aggregate features for users and apply the majority post label. And for the post level, we're gonna get separate features for posts, and we'll apply the author's label if we don't have um, labels at the post level already. So um, I'm going to sh In the second case, are you getting the author's label from this process, or does it come from somewhere else? So in four forums, we have annotations where people, the, the Turkers did it at the author level. In Create Debate, people have self-labeled when they write a post. So it's at the post level. So we kind of have to do the cross product. Um, so at the, for create debate, when we want author labels, we have to um, take the majority post label and vice versa for four forums when we want the post label, we have to take the author's so label. Parties look at all like political debate and it's always like, yeah, like left versus right or against Democratic versus Republican type of thing. Because otherwise, what is the semantics of aggregating over taking majority voter across all the posts of the same author? Um, right, so these are stances on a particular topic. So the major aggregating by taking the majority would be to say that there's some sort of consistency about the person. So when they write multiple posts on the same topic. So these are all on the same topic. Exactly. Nice. Yes, yes, yes. So the, the more complicated question is then to aggregate, you know, to understand something about ideology and the interactions between topics. But here we're saying we're going to look at per topic. So I'm going to show some um, findings, and I'll focus on a specific topic from four forums um, just for sort of ease of exposition, but these same trends held across all the different topics that we evaluated on. Um, and the first finding was that this, this granularity of aggregating information does have ramifications. So we evaluated on two tasks. On one of the tasks was to predict the stance of users, and the other was to predict the stance of posts. And it turns out that the best performing model for both tasks is this joint model, which was jointly modeling the polarity of the disagreement and agreement links, and was modeling at the author level. And that's maybe not so surprising for the author stance task, because you're predicting the stance of people, that's fine. Um, but it, it turns out that even when you're trying to understand the stance of posts, aggregating at the author level was important. Yeah. You said that when people reply, you're treating that as an indication of disagreement, right? That, yeah, right, so that would be corresponding to the simple collective model right. in this case. But it could also be, the, and sometimes is the case, that we're, so maybe it's true that mostly it's the case that people are more motivated to reply if they're yeah. But they sometimes reply to say, I, no, I agree with that. Yeah, point. exactly. Does that just show up as error in your models, or do you have some way of, of identifying when a reply is an agreement, not a disagreement? So um, the joint model is, is, is exactly trying to model that from text, right? So it's trying to say when is, I'm going to, as well as inferring stance, infer whether people are disagreeing or whether they're agreeing. And then if they're agreeing, it uses a different set of constraints or dependencies to enforce consistency. So if they agree, it'll say I should have, people should have the same stance. So, and we're evaluating here, this is all accuracy for a stance and not disagreement. So but you're looking at the structure of the dyad and saying, yeah. my, my prior is that that means disagreement. Um, no, so that's the only model that makes that assumption is 
not is the simple collective model, not the joint model. So our contribution was to come up with more sophisticated methods that can jointly sort of model the edge and node labels in this graph. So what are you getting out of the edge then if you're just looking at the text anyway? So the text, um, so all models use the text as a local feature for stance. Um, the simple collective model does not use the text for disagreement, but then the joint model also uses the text to understand something about how people um, support or disagree with one another. Did I answer your question? Okay. Um, okay. So going back to this, the method that did assume that disagreement was an indicator of uh, sorry, the method that agreed, uh, assumed that replies were an indicator of disagreement, actually that can be a harmful assumption to make in certain kind of nuanced topics. And um, we had this finding in multiple different topics, and um, I can show an example, or I'm going to show an example in you know, one specific um, topic, gun control, where we have this post-reply pair. And you know, I'll give you a second to read it. And um, this, the stances in this post-reply pair were correctly predicted by our um, joint model, whereas the simple collective model was not able to capture the stances correctly. Because exactly like you said earlier, there is nuance here where people might say, um, you know, I, I agree with you on this and this, but I disagree on these other things. And so. Um, and they can still have the same stance under these different conditions. So um, it is important to kind of model this nuance and the joint model is able to more um, powerfully capture these, these patterns. And so the takeaway is that I, I looked at it in this specific problem where we have disagreement agreement sort of relationships, but this general property of being able to use similarity or dissimilarity to propagate um, information across predictions is a useful and uh, general template that shows up in um, many social science problems. And so the next part of my talk is going to look at fusing information and um, combining multiple signals for prediction. And so for this, um, we looked at Twitter for people that tweeted about going to their first AA meeting. And for these users, we gather tweets before they said that, and we gather tweets after for up to 90 days, um, and actually beyond. But I'm going to look at the 90-day recovery mark, because that's um, typically, you know, that's, that's a, they, they use that as a benchmark in, um, for AA. And to kind of understand what happens after 90 days, we look for very clear indications in the text for these users that say that they've maintained their sobriety or they've continued to stay sober, or that they've relapsed after 90 days. And so this is how we acquire these, these labels of indications that they've relapsed. And for these users, we also go out and collect tweets of their friends, which on Twitter, we're, we're defining friends as people that I follow that follow me back. And we whittle that set down by looking for people who um, kind of co-mention one another and you know, um, often retweet one another's posts because we think that's a stronger indication of um, you know, uh, ties between people than just following. So we have these kind of egocentric networks at the end of it um, where we have these users who we care about their relapse or not and then we get a um, network of their friends and their, their tweets. And here, um, the main intuition that we kind of want to capture is how our friends' behavior kind of correlates with our um, own behavior. So um, here we have contrasting sort of negative and positive interactions. So in one case, you know, the, the person who's attending AA might say something like, I, you know, I feel like I feel like I want to drink. And my friend might enable that kind of behavior by, you know, retweeting something very positive about alcohol. Versus I might say something about my sobriety. Um, and my friend might 
you know, reaffirm that or give me some positive affirmation, and that might be sort of supportive behavior that, um, you know, is a good predictor of my ability to recover. Um, so with all this text, there's actually multiple language signals that we can use. So we uh, first came up with a dictionary of words corresponding to alcohol and worse, words corresponding to sobriety. And um, here we were able to use some domain knowledge from um, our collaborator at UMD did this, came up with these two dictionaries. And we can model this intuition with uh, these two relationships, um, uses alcohol word and uses sober word. The next thing is that we care about affect and sentiment um, as well. Because someone might be talking about sobriety, but they might say sobriety sucks. So um, for affect, we turn to LIWC, which, um, like I said before, is a manually um, curated dictionary that um, has come up with a whole bunch of semantic categories and maps words to those <coughs> different categories. Um, and we look at Senti WordNet, which, um, again, ascribes a kind of positive and negative valences for a lot of different words. And we're able to capture um, these relationships by using pause affect and pause sentiment as the, the um, relationships. So do, 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 do they think kind of like, glad I'm not drinking, glad I'm drinking, you know, so the, like, are you, which is beyond the, right, these, or I mean, I don't know, so is this a problem or? Yeah, I mean, so, I guess I've given very contrived examples of uh, these things, right? So you're absolutely right that there's a lot of things that won't be captured by these simple language signals. And this is exactly why we need to take into account the context and the structure, because language is not going to get, is only going to get you so far. But um, you might have just a handful of users who, whose language signals are fairly clear, right? And structure helps us propagate that information across other users. And so that's, that's really the statistical strength that we want to leverage here. So um, the final thing, again, very contrived example, but there are um, more you know, uh, nuanced sort of words that might be associated with alcohol or sobriety that just coming up with a dictionary might not be able to capture. And for this, um, we use seated LDA. And seated LDA is a way to use domain knowledge in um, topic modeling um, where you can seed certain topics with particular words that you expect to be associated with those topics. So here, we seeded the alcohol and sober topics with the dictionaries that we came up with. And um, the benefit of doing that in addition to be, being able to use some domain knowledge is um, that now you, you have two topics that you can very clearly say that this is, these are the ones I want, I care about and I want to kind of use. Um, and we can use this information with both tweet and user topics. Again, aggregating at these different levels kind of comes up again. So the kinds of um, signals that will model. Again, this should be familiar from the previous part of the work um, where we were trying to model something at the, the um, local level. So here, we're going to try and understand if the tweets of a user um, tend to um, go towards a lot of alcohol-related topics. And if they do, we might say that there's, there's, there's a probability that they won't recover and vice versa for recovery. And again, like the previous um, section, I'm not gonna go over every single rule that we used, but I'm just gonna give you a flavor of the kinds of dependencies that we model just to be able to fuse um, the different language signals together. So um, using those alcohol words and sober words that we defined, we might um, oh, sorry, this is the LDA um, rules. Um, so using the alcohol and sober topics that we found, we might want to encode something that says, you know, um, if my friend uh, has a propensity for going towards these alcohol topics and they're positive about it, 
that might not be a good indication about my recovery because that might mean they're sort of um, engaging in a lot of enabling behavior. And same for um, sobriety. So if my friends tweet tweets positively about um, sobriety fairly often, then that might be um, a good sign for me. And those same intuitions we can capture by using different combinations of our language signals. So we can use the um, affect signal from LIWC, and we can use the alcohol and sober words that we defined to capture the same sort of negative versus positive interactions. Yeah. Wait, so the, the top thing, the, the topic and sentiment terms, are they just lumping everything together or are they looking just at the focal user? So in this case, um, this is per, on a t per tweet basis, so they're not lumping together. But um, the thing that I want to point out is in this full model, we actually considered all combinations of these things to understand um, how we can combine different sentiment signals and different topic signals, both at the user and tweet level. So another important takeaway here to really highlight is that um, this is a nice kind of unified framework where if you have a bunch of different domain knowledge and different models that you want to evaluate, um, you can kind of encode different bits of intuition to understand which actually holds out better in the data. Um, All right, I, I think I just misunderstood before. So the, 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 the tweet topic in the first line yeah. refers to U1's tweet. I see. So like U2 is retweeting U1 and U1 said something positive about sobriety or alcohol. Is that right? It's, I think it's, it's, it's actually U2's tweet. Sorry. So... Um, Yeah, you won. You're right. Yeah. Okay. You're right. Second one. This in the second one, um, we're looking at the what friend. the friend is saying, whereas in you one, we're looking at what the user is saying. Yes. And these Thank are you. separate models, or they're both? They're, they're all in the same the same model. Okay. Um, that's right. So. So I guess, I guess maybe I'll get to that uh, later in the talk. So I guess like the way I'm imagining this is that. Uh, you're just kind of like trying at all these new constraints, and then you get better fits. So you maybe add, you get worse fits, you drop constraints. So how are you not worried about overfitting? You know, just kind of like starting to kind of create to, to create your own patterns, kind of. So um, one thing that I have not highlighted a lot in this particular work is that in this probabilistic soft logic framework, we also associate weights with the rules that we introduce. So these are first order rules, and we associate a weight with them. Um, and the weight gives us some sense of relative importance of satisfying that rule versus other rules. And that are basically the parameters that we can fit from training data the same way that we might fit. So I'm, I'm not sure where it is actually. Like, so, so what I'm asking is, like, so you, um, I imagine that you did not come up with the list of all of these rules, uh, like, uh, you just, so, or do you just kind of sit down, come up with all of the rules? and you throw it at the system and you're done? Is that how this works or is it more iterative? And that, so my question was like, once it's iterative, then you just kind of are probably playing with it and uh, sometimes you get a fit, sometimes you get a worse fit, better fit. That's a good question. So in that case, so typically what we do is we might come up with a lot of rules and the weights, you know, where that comes into play is that you might not sit there and try one rule at a time, but rather you'd come up with a model and then do weight learning to estimate the relative importances. And um, the standard kind of philosophy applies here as well, where you want to do this kind of looking at what happens and tweaking your model and so on on a validation data set, or if you have multiple validation data sets, that's the best. And in this case, um, we keep we kept sort of held out data that we never looked at before. The file data was it from a different time period or different? Uh... Users. users, just a different set of users, yeah. And I mean, there's a whole, you know, different work on how do you come up with the right held out data set and so on, but um, yeah. So um, and then finally, uh, we also want to go back to that collective idea of how do we enforce consistency across predictions. And here, um, 
we want to encode some notion of homophily that says that you know similar people have similar behavior. And so here to get similarity, we look at cosine similarity between tweets of users, and that gives us a score that we can then say if um, you know similar users either will both recover or both not recover. And so, like I said, there are a lot of other rules that I didn't show here, but this. Um, full combined approach was able to outperform a text-only baseline for predicting relapse after 90 days. But I think the more interesting thing is that um, there are real examples in the tweets of sort of enabling and supportive behavior. And that goes to show that um, this richer model that fused different patterns in the language and encoded different dependencies was actually kind of um, getting at real behaviors and interactions that were happening in the data. So, um, you know, there, someone who is going to AA might, um, you know, talk about how they want to drink and friends might actually encourage them by saying, you know, like, yeah, let's, you know, let's, let's have beer or let's drink. Um, whereas, you know, we also see um, people who exhibit a lot of friends who exhibit a lot of supportive behavior towards recovery as well. So the takeaway here is that by fusing signals, we can combine sort of um, sources of different reliabilities. We can capture more nuanced dependencies than we would otherwise. And importantly, um, like I said, you might have different models in your head of how the world might play out. And you can kind of encode all of these together, um, or you can evaluate different sets of model and see, see which bears out best on data in a unified framework. And so the last part of my talk is going to look at some efforts towards supporting causal inference and discovery on observational data sets. So for this, I'm going to look at a mood modeling data set. Um, this was an application that um, came out of UC Santa Cruz where users can log on and uh, log across a whole range of time a whole bunch of different behavioral factors. So they might rate their mood, energy, um, sleep, and so on on any given day. And um, on top of this, they, have, they include a text description of their day. So this is different and unique in that not only do you have this standard observational data of, of measurements of a whole bunch of variables, you have um, free-form text going with every single um, instance. And we might want to ask a causal question, like we want to estimate the causal effect of exercise on mood. Um, and I'm, we're currently focusing on this particular link because it's well validated in literature and so it's a good sort of gold standard to try and um, study. So you know, the standard um, tools for causal analysis might be that you first perform matching to understand for all treatment units. So in this case, we can say that you know, treatment are those that um, exercised. We want to kind of find um, uh, control units that are most similar to the treatment units. And we can get similarity from a whole bunch of different techniques, including um, Euclidean distance and sort of nearest neighbor sort of matching. So um, then there are a lot of different techniques that support this causal estimation, including doing sort of um, looking at the average difference between the uh, control and treatment group, including regression. And there are a lot of sophisticated techniques beyond this, but regression is one of the simplest ones. But there's sort of requirements for causal inference to be sound. And so um, the first one is that we need to include all these common causes of both the, the treatment and outcome, both in our matching and regression. So we have these confounding variables, and they should be included in our analysis. But we want to avoid spurious associations, and that can come from including these collider variables, which both the treatment and outcome cause, 
and we want to exclude such variables from our analysis. The problem is that, especially when we have these observational data sets, um, like the one I showed you, there are so many unmeasured latent confounders. Um, so there's no way that just from looking at that observational data alone, we could have measured every single confounder. So the force push, which is ongoing efforts with my psychology um, and sociology collaborators at UC Santa Cruz, is um, to use the text as a way to come up with proxies for all these potentially hidden confounder variables. So um, here we're proposing to improve the matching techniques by um, turning to LIWC categories again um, to come up with text-based variables that are potentially co-correlated with both outcome and treatment and treat them as um, proxies for the latent confounders in the observational data set. Can you say that? Um, so what about post-treatment stuff? Are you potentially controlling for things that are post-treatment? Um, do you mean to say, is this like, uh, how do you, so you want to avoid control. it? So you're talking about like controlling for colliders, right? But like the colliders, you want right? To avoid controlling for anything that's on the pathway between the treatment and the outcome. So I'm just wondering how you distinguish in the text. Um, from the text, we're not going to try and distinguish that. And I'm going to talk a, in just a few more slides. I'm going to introduce a method that can then come up, give us a tool to better ask, answer these questions of identifiability. Um, so yeah, we'll get there in just a second. So that um, kind of starts to bring us to this question exactly of well, we're just looking, you know, from from text. Um, it does. It's not enough to just kind of look at co-correlations, right? Because we might end up conditioning on. Um, potential colliders that could introduce selection bias. And so for this, I'm going to um, turn away from standard causal inference and go towards causal graphs. And so um, there's a whole community on causal graphical models where there's a, there's a semantic here with the edges that say that a parent causes or is a, a direct cause of the child, which means that the changes in the parent's values will always change the child's values. And so um, one of the important uses of a causal graph is that um, it gives us a language and a tool to answer questions about identifiability. So it tells us you know, which causal inferences can I um, actually make from this data because I have the correct set of con um, confounders. It, t it can give a, uh, tell us about what um, variables not to condition on so that we avoid selection bias. But the problem is that, especially in a big data set or in a data set where you're mining confounders from text, you may not know this graph at all, or you might know only parts of this graph. And so in the causal discovery um, literature, there's a lot of work on finding this structure, or at least parts of the structure from observational data alone. So you want to maximally orient these causal relationships. And one way to do this is by constraints um, from the observational data. And these constraints come from conditional independence tests run on the observational data. And um, because this graphical model encodes a set of conditional independent statements, um, by doing these tests on data, we can basically reverse engineer parts of the graph, or it gives, it, you know, gives us restrictions on what valid graphs can be. And I guess I, you know, I, I want to keep emphasizing that, of course, you're not going to be able to find all the causal edges. Um, not all of them will be identifiable, but um, you basically will get um, some un undirected edges and some directed edges. So. Um, here, uh, we recently had a paper that um, we cast this problem of discovering causal relationships as an inference problem. So for all pairs of variables, we associate you know, a, a causal um, prediction variable and um, something called an ancestral 
prediction variable. And ancestor here refers to um, long and indirect causal links, so a linear path of causal relationships. Um, and the inputs to this problem will be these independent statements um, and conditional independent statements. And um, from these, we can also infer adjacencies, which are undirected edges. And um, I'm not going to go into all the constraints that we used, but I just want to illustrate that the, some of the common ones that come up. So um, the first one that we, we can encode um, as constraints are finding colliders along a path. Um, and then by fusing together this causal prediction and ancestral prediction, we have rules as well that can model um, common parents. And then um, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of work on how you can use constraints to characterize ancestral edges, and we um, use that literature as well to come up with um, constraints just from statistical tests that ta tell us about um, the ancestral graph. So um, the point here is not to kind of go into detail on these rules and what these constraints mean and how they, they arrive, but the point is to show that um, with a framework like probabilistic soft logic, we were able to encode well understood constraints and fuse them together in one system, um, whereas previously before, these were done iteratively, so the constraints would be applied um, one rule at a time and would propagate a lot of prediction errors. Um, and here we do this as a joint inference problem. And um, the application to this was in uh, the genomic setting, so we were able to successfully um, show an application in predicting gene regulatory networks, and we saw significant improvements, um, as well as results on being able to fuse text in this kind of discovery inference problem. Um, but I'm not going to go into those results here. Instead, um, I want to look at sort of going back to this problem of where does, you know, why is this graph important to our initial problem? And the main takeaway here is that the graph that we infer can be a tool that we then use to answer questions about identifiability. And it, analyzing this DAG can help us um, to understand what spurious associations might arise by um, conditioning on colliders and so on. Um, and it can also, understanding the paths can help us um, search for confounders as well. Um, the last thing I also want to just mention that is an open question right now that we're looking at in this data set also is um, modeling sort of the structure between observations, these entries, and users. So again, this is an aggregation problem. And a lot of, there's been a lot of work in um, literature where they say that, you know, for a user, if I have all these entries, I'm going to, you know, assign them to treatment if they exercise even once. But that is maybe a very poor assumption that um, we don't want to make here. We might want to come up with better ways of aggregating data. So that's um, something we're, we're studying. And um, there's a lot of other work that I've done that I didn't go over today. So I've also worked on discovering rules automatically from these kind of relational data sets, as well as um, applying all these different modeling patterns to biological applications. So I'd like to just quickly conclude with um, a roadmap of my future research. And I'm going to highlight some work um, from MSR to just show how I think you know, I can be a complementary fit. So um, uh, first, I think that there's a great opportunity to unify unsupervised and structured methods for text analysis. So there's a lot of work on topic modeling and word embeddings and factorization methods to understand um, interaction between people and attitudes. And here I think there's a, 
an opportunity to include um, structured prediction methods, like the ones I work on, and learn biases on social and news media, as well as characterize evolving ideology, ideologies and ties between groups. Um, then I think that um, there's an opportunity to continue to combine other kinds of data for causality. So here we looked at text, and um, I think we can continue to exploit additional sources of data to discover um, hidden variables as well as identify you know, potential outcomes and treatments from text data or social media data. Um, also, there's a lot of work on detecting uh, causal relationships from text and understanding why people do things just based on language. Um, and so I think detecting and characterizing reasons from text data is a very interesting problem. Um, and finally, um, there's a lot of work on understanding spreads and diffusions of ideas on networks. And there, um, it's already very common in practice to look at structure and the relationships of interactions between users. And here, I propose to um, combine a more comprehensive model of the user. So you can use the language and social media data to understand that um, you know, if you're looking at the spread of uh, fake news, understand that some users are actually maybe just more prone to being gullible or prone to being um, influenced by um, fake news and so on. And my work on discovering rules and interactions, I think, can also be applied to um, discover new patterns of interactions that were not obvious to us before from the data itself. So in a nutshell, um, we saw that these methods that can exploit structure are more broadly applicable templates in many different social science problems, and that methods that can then fuse different signals can help us capture more nuanced dependencies. And then it was important to uh, leverage new modes of evidence to support causal inference from observational data. And also, um, by discovering models from data directly, we can um, help support better causal reasoning and um, better reasoning in general. So um, this is um, all my work for more details. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. So thank you.